This tutorial covers an introduction to Pilot version 3.0. This is a major new release, so there are many changes. Pilot is a modern community-driven code for coastal deformation modeling. The primary developers are myself, Brad Agard at the US Geological Survey, Matthew Nepley at the University of Buffalo, and Charles Williams at GNS Science in New Zealand. Pilot combines the dynamic modeling capabilities EQSIM that was developed 20 years ago as part of my thesis with the quasi-static modeling capabilities of Tecton developed 20 to 30 years ago by Charles Williams and others. It uses modern software engineering to develop an open source community code with a modular design, significant and extensive testing, documentation, and distribution. The first version of Pilot was released in 2007. What research questions is Pilot designed to address? It's mainly designed to address quasi-static modeling associated with earthquakes. In terms of strain accumulation associated with earthquake deformation, some of these uh, questions are, what is the stressing rate on uh, specific faults? Where is strain accumulating in the crust? What are co-seismic stress changes associated with the slip distribution from a given earthquake? Uh, as well as what the slip distribution in that earthquake was, primarily from geodetic data is, um, where Pilot is uh, most aptly uh, suited for the inversion problem. However, we will be expanding this in the coming years. We, Pilot is also designed to answer post-seismic uh, relaxation questions, such as what rheology is consistent with what uh, observed post-seismic deformation, and can aseismic creep or after slip explain the deformation as opposed to bulk relaxation. Pilot is also suited for dynamic modeling with earthquakes, uh, specifically for strong ground motions, that is forecasting the amplitude and spatial variation of ground motions for scenario earthquakes, as well as reconstructing uh, past historical earthquakes, examining dynamic and static co-seismic stress changes uh, associated with fault slip, as well as earthquake rupture behavior, such as questions related to fault constitutive models and parameters uh, and observed rupture propagation uh, in both a single uh, fault as well as multiple faults triggering each other. Pilot can also be used for volcanic deformation associated with magma reservoirs and dikes. And this is uh, significantly expanded with our uh, addition of pore elasticity, uh, as we will discuss. Pilot can address questions related to an inflation of magma reservoirs, such as what is the geometry what is the potential for eruption in terms of where is the uh, uh, where is the magma moving? As soon as also looking at the def, uh, in terms of eruption characteristics and dike intrusions in terms of where is the deformation occurring? Uh, what is the geometry? What is the pressure changes uh, and amount of opening and dilatation of a dike? As I mentioned, Pilot version three is a major release. It is a major rewrite that we started over five years ago, uh, and it is meant to address a significant number of issues. The first one is that in Pilot version two, the governing equation uh, and previous versions, the governing equation was hardwired to elasticity. In Pilot version three, the governing equation is flexible. We already have three different governing equations implemented, elasticity, incompressible elasticity, as well as probe elasticity. In Pilot version two, we had a uh, a limited number of ways to discretize uh, a simulation in terms of uh, time dependence. We use backward Euler for quasi-static and the Newmark central difference method for dynamic problems. In Pilot version three, we use the Petzi time stepping, uh, which provides primarily Runga Kata methods that give higher order accuracy. In Pilot version two, the spatial discretization is hardwired to be first order. In Pilot version three, it is flexible, and we've tested uh, up to fourth order spatial uh, discretization schemes. The final definition itself in, in version two was hardwired into Pilot in the code. In version three, we use the Petsy data structures to provide the final element definition. So you can see we've moved a lot of the functionality related to this finite element discretization from Pilot down into Petsy. And this gives us much greater flexibility as well as uh, reduces the amount of um, finite element uh, general information that Pilot has to maintain. 
There are several new features in PyLeth version three, and I'm gonna highlight three of them here. As I've mentioned, we have multi-physics. This is elasticity for linear isotropic materials, linear Maxwell, generalized Maxwell, and parallel viscoelastic models. We have incompressible elasticity for linear isotropic materials and poor elasticity for linear isotropic materials. The higher order basis functions allow us to select the basis functions independent of the mesh, which defines the geometry. This permits a higher uh, resolution or accuracy of the solution for a given mesh. Uh, in replacing, uh, in switching to the Petsy time stepping algorithms, we replace this, our simple Pyleth time stepping algorithms. Um, and this provides more support for higher order discretizations in time, as well as real adaptive time stepping. Other features that are new in Python version three is you can now import finite meshes from GMesh, which is open source, in addition to the previous uh, ability uh, importers from Qubit, that's the Exodus 2 file, as well as LaGrit and MeshIO ASCII files. We now have default Petsy options that are based on the materials, that is the governing equations. We've uh, re-implemented static greens functions with user specified discretization of the fault slip impulses. We have a modular approach for initial conditions. You can output the subfields uh, output of information with a user-defined basis order. Uh, you can uh, provide simulation metadata uh, and there's a command line utility for searching through that uh, metadata so you can find simulations that you previously run and based on features. We converted the code to Python 3. We converted the LaTeX documentation to Sphinx uh, and mark of these structured text. This provides both a PDF version of the manual as well as an online version available to read the docs. We have added extensive testing using the method of manufactured solutions. Uh, Pilot version three, uh, we've had a number of contributors that have uh, provided uh, input to the development via hackathons and collaborations, uh, and the list of people is shown here. And this is a great ex ex expanse of the people contributing to Pilot compared to previous versions. And we look forward to more contributions from other people in the future as well. Uh, in terms of our current status of Pilot version three, most features from version 2.2 uh, have been re-implemented, tested, and documented. There are still a few features and under the hood improvements that are almost ready that we hope to make available in the coming uh, month. This includes elasticity with inertia and prescribed fault slip, as well as, well as parallel mesh loading. A few major features in version 2.2 have not yet been implemented, and we expect to be, have these implemented in the next six months. This includes spontaneous fault rupture via fault friction and the small strain formulation for elasticity. So now we're going to run through all of the uh, main features of Pilot version 3.0.0, and you'll see in green. Uh, everything that is done in orange is what is uh, in progress, and the purple is coming later. Uh, so for elasticity, we have static and quasi-static problems. The dynamic problems with inertia are in progress. We have infinitesimal strains. The small strain is in progress. We have gravitational body forces, as well as just uh, generalized body forces. We have bulk rheologies in terms of isotropic linear elasticity isotropic linear Maxwell viscoelasticity, isotropic linear generalized Maxwell viscoelasticity, and isotropic parallel viscoelasticity. The darker Prager elastoplasticity will be coming soon. For incompressible elasticity, we have static and quasi-static problems, infinitesimal strains, gravitational body forces, and uh, general body forces, uh, and we have a single bulk rheology in terms of isotropic linear elasticity. For poroelasticity, we have static and quasi-static problems, infinitesimal strains, gravitational body forces, general body forces, as well as a single constituent model in terms of isotropic linear elasticity. Boundary conditions, we have time-dependent Dirichlet boundary conditions, time-dependent Neumann boundary conditions, and absorbing boundary conditions. For the fault, we have prescribed slip. Those are also sometimes referred to as kinematic ruptures. Uh, on the fault interfaces with multiple ruptures. Uh, and as I mentioned, the fault friction uh, will be coming soon. We can import meshes from GMesh, from Qubit via the Exodus 2 file, ASCII files, as well as LaGrit. Uh, 
And we plan now that we can import meshes from Gmesh, we plan to deprecate uh, the Legrit importing because we haven't used it in several years. We have uh, initial conditions. The output is available as HDF5 and VTK files. You can output the solution over the domain and output the solution over an external boundary of the domain, output the solution interpolated to user specific points such as GPS or seismic stations. Uh, you can output the solution over materials and boundary conditions and output the state variables, uh, most commonly stress and strain for each material. Uh, the fault information you can currently output slip, uh, outputting the fault tractions is in progress. Uh, other features include automatic conversion of units for all parameters, parallel uniform global refinement. This allows you uh, to refine the mesh after, the, after it has been distributed among processors to get to an even higher resolution. Uh, we have some uh, interfaces for the PETSI linear and nonlinear solvers. We can output uh, the simulation progress, which estimates the total runtime as it steps through time steps. Um, and uh, we have default PETSI options that are based on the material or governing equation. And this greatly uh, improves uh, the ability of the user to use the best PETSI solver options, as well as uh, good monitoring and error checking. How do these changes from pilot version two to version three affect users? There are no changes to importing meshes using qubit, ASCII files, and Legrit. Anything, any meshes that were previously generated using those tools can still be uh, imported without any changes. The formats of the spatial database files are the same. The main substantial changes are to the parameter, uh, usually .cfg files, as well as we've changed uh, the format of the names in spatial database files. HDF5 is now the default output. Uh, this gives much better performance than writing to the ASCII VTK files. Um, and as I mentioned with our default PETSI options, uh, for most users, there's no need to specify any PETSI options at all. The defaults are very well suited for most problems. So now we're gonna go over the governing equations for elasticity. Uh, and I'll make a note that uh, if you want more details about the governing equations and their final implementation, see the governing equations section of the pilot manual for a detailed discussion. Uh, in this tutorial, I will not cover the incompressible elasticity or the poor elasticity. So just as an introduction uh, to the final method, uh, here I show the strong form uh, of the equation and how we convert it to a weak form. So the strong form would be given here by a partial differential equation. And to convert that to a weak form for solving and discretization using the final method, we multiply by a trial function and integrate over the domain and set that equal to zero. And this is meant to minimize any uh, error with respect to unknown coefficients for solving the partial differential equation. This leads to equations of the form where you have an integral of a trial function dotted with some uh, uh, functional form and then gradients in the trial function dotted uh, with some functional. Um, and all of that integral is set equal to zero. Uh, for the PETI uh, solutions and uh, linear and nonlinear solvers as well as the time stepping, we need to put the equation uh, in this form where we have a left-hand side that depends on time, the solution, and the, uh, the, uh, the time derivative of the solution. And then we put our terms on the right-hand side that are based on time and the solution. We may have initial conditions that give uh, the solution at our uh, initial starting point. Um, and after you use the final method and divergence theorem, you can generally cast the weak form into this, this form here, where you have trial functions dotted uh, within uh, a functional that is a vector. And then you have gradients in the trial function double contracted with uh, a tensor. Um, and then you have the same form on the right-hand side uh, should you have just a time dependence in the solution. So now let's look in detail about how we do this for elasticity and I'll use the example of where we're prescribing the slip. Our uh, solution uh, field has subfields for displacement and the Lagrange multiplier associated with the tractions uh, across the fault surface. We have our elasticity equation here. I show body forces. This is uh, a combination of uh, body forces as well as gravitational body forces. 
the divergence of the stress equals zero. Uh, this is for the case of quasi-static elasticity. We have our Neumann boundary condition. We have our Dirichlet boundary condition. We have our constrained fault slip where the jump and displacement across the fault is equal to slip. Uh, and then on the fault surface, we also have uh, that the tractions are equal and opposite on the two sides of the fault. We create the weak form by taking the dot product with the trial function for the elasticity, it's with the displacement trial function. For the uh, prescribed slip, it's the trial function for the Lagrange multiplier and integrating over the domain. So here's our body forces times our trial function. The stress uh, is contracted with uh, the gradient of the trial function. Then we have our Neumann boundary condition uh, associated with our uh, external boundaries. We have a similar type boundary condition associated with our faults, where instead we place the traction with the Lagrange multiplier equal and opposite on the two sides of the fault. And then we have our constraint equation, which constrains the jump and displacement is equal to our prescribed slip. Now we can rewrite these equations and identify our F terms um, and those uh, functions uh, that we have in our general form. And so we have an F0 that's related to displacement associated with the body forces, an F1 function for our residual that's associated with the stresses, an F0 function associated with our external boundary tractions and Lagrange multipliers. For the prescribed slip, we have an F0 function that's associated with our slip constraint. And uh, in the code, in the pilot code, we supply these F0 and F1 functions. And Petsy uh, takes care of the underlying integration um, using those pointwise functions. And so in this case, we put all the terms on the left-hand side, and our right-hand side is equal to 0. The Jacobians uh, are given in terms of uh, this formula here, where for each term, you take the derivative with respect to the specific solution field, as well as the derivative with respect to the, uh, the time derivative of that solution field. In this case, we don't have any time derivatives uh, with respect to the solution uh, in our governing equation. So we end up with our elasticity constants. Um, this is a specific term of the Jacobian uh, because we have derivatives of both the trial function and the basis function. For our Lagrange multipliers, we have simply uh, delta functions associated uh, with those degrees of freedom. Uh, and then on the right-hand side, our Jacobian uh, is equal to zero. This gives an overhaul uh, structure of the left-hand side Jacobian of a saddle point. So we have our basically our tangential stiffness matrix here, and then our coupling terms across the fault uh, shown here by uh, C and C transpose. So we have a symmetric uh, Jacobian um, with a saddle point that we have to deal with uh, when we do the solve. Uh, and generally, we use a sure complement uh, to solve this equation that gives the most efficient access. So now let's talk about uh, how this binomial uh, implementation uh, needs to be addressed by the user. In general, as I mentioned, the pointwise functions for the residual and Jacobian are selected automatically based on the governing equation and the materials. Uh, and the user has to provide input once we get to the point of talking about the solution field and the discretization. So for fields and subfields, by field, it's a finite element coefficient for the basis functions. These are generally values at the vertices on edges, faces, or in cells, and they are stored in what we call a field. A field is composed of a section which associates the points, that's the vertices, edges, spaces, and cells in our fine element mesh with the coefficients of the basis functions, as well as a Petsy uh, vector, which is the vector that stores all of those coefficients. Uh, so we operate on the vectors doing matrix uh, vector multiplication and other operations such as dot products. Um, and uh, the field may hold one or more subfields. So in the case of uh, parameters for isotropic linear elastic material, uh, that field would hold, uh, would have subfields for density, the shear modulus, and the bulk modulus. For the discretization, each subfield within a field can have a different discretization. So you can select the basis order 
uh, of that discretization independently. Uh, the default basis order is one. Um, we, we often keep this, use the default field for our default basis order for the solution field. Um, however, for uh, parameters, especially if we have uniform material properties, we use a basis order of zero to reduce storage requirements because this mean, uh, a basis order of zero means we only have to store uh, one value for uh, the parameters of a, of a cell or an element in the final element. Uh, a little more information about solution and auxiliary fields. For the solution field, the subfields match the unknown in the governing equation. For elasticity, this is for quasi-static elasticity, this is just the displacement. For dynamic elasticity, this is both the displacement and velocity. For incompressible elasticity, this is uh, the displacement as well as the internal pressure. And the, the solution field contains all the final coefficients that correspond to the problem solution. Um, any subfield uh, of the solution can be output over the domain. This can be an extra, as well as external boundaries or specified locations in the domain, such as uh, GPS stations or seismic stations. Um, so the solution field is associated with our unknowns. We also have what we call auxiliary fields. And these are all of the parameters uh, for various entities, such as materials, boundary conditions, and fault interfaces. Uh, each parameter of an auxiliary field, such as a scalar vector tensor um, or some other uh, discretization, is held in a separate subfield. So we refer to those uh, parameters uh, by the name of the subfield. It also holds all state variables, such as uh, for our viscoelasticity, it holds a viscous strain uh, for our viscoelastic bulk rheologies. Uh, any subfield of an auxiliary field can be output uh, after the initialization, so you can see what the what material property values are and their spatial variation. And then you can get uh, that same output or the state variables and solution also after solving the equations. Uh, for time steps, this is after each time step. Uh, and for other um, cases like uh, static Green's functions, this is after it computes the response to each Green's function. Here is our typical uh, workflow for our crustal deformation modeling problem. Uh, we start with geologic structure, we generate our mesh, we run our simulation on our physics code, and then we visualize results. So here is pilot, that's a CIG code. Uh, there's also relax, which is a CIG code. There are commercial codes that do things similar, such as abacus. Uh, for mesh generation, uh, we have uh, the open source GMesh, uh, you can also use qubit um, or Legrit. Uh, to generate geologic structure, you can use sophisticated geologic structure modeling programs such as GoCAD and EarthVision, which are both commercial. Um, you can also just use general CAD programs such as OpenCascade, which is open source. Uh, for visualization, uh, we often use ParaView because it has a very simple user interface. Alternatives include Visit for 2D plotting, uh, we often use matplotlib, uh, and you can also use uh, GMT to visualize output, uh, primarily uh, on the ground surface uh, for Pyloth. It is not very well suited for the 3D uh, visualization that are uh, much better in pair of view and visit. Um, so within a, a given Pyloth simulation, you have to get your mesh from somewhere, so we use Qubit, Gmesh, Legrit, or just a simple text editor to generate our mesh. That is uh, one of the main input files for Pyloth. You also need simulation parameters. This includes the parameter file that we often store in a format called .cfg. Uh, and then what we have what we call spatial databases. And these are specifying the parameters such as material properties as a function of space, boundary condition values as a function of space, and things like fault slip as a function of space. The output from Pyloth uh, is either HDF5, which is the default, or VTK files. When we write HDF5 files, we also write XDMF files. Uh, the XDMF files are these lightweight, uh, basically metadata files that allow Paraview and Visit to know where to access the information they uh, expect within the HDF5 files. Uh, and when we do our post-processing, uh, 
we often use Python and matplotlib uh, with the h5py package to read our hdf5 files. The hdf5 files can also be read directly uh, in programs, other programs such as MATLAB. This is just a typical views of, of finite meshes. So in this case, this is our reverse 2D example showing discretization uh, using unstructured quadrihedrals. Uh, you can see we have a finer discretization up here. This is where we have a reverse fault and a splay fault. Uh, and then we coarsen with distance from the fault. This is a 3D subduction zone case uh, where we've discretized it with tetrahedra. You can see our, the geometry of the slab. We have uh, an oceanic crust, or sorry, a, a continental crust, uh, and then the mantle, uh, and we also have a wedge uh, in that case as well. This is just to give you an idea of what these uh, discretizations uh, look like. A couple words about our fault interface. Our fault interfaces are internal, our interior surfaces where we have slip and tractions across the fault that are equal and opposite. We uh, set a normal direction on our fault so we have uh, an idea of what the orientation is. Uh, that's so that we can have consistent uh, information about this uh, slip direction. Um, and we consider the fault to have both uh, a negative side and positive side that are uh, joined together uh, and coupled by the displacements and tractions. This is how we actually implement the fault. So uh, when you generate your mesh, you don't actually have the fault in there. You just mark where you want the fault to be. If you have any uh, buried edges within the fault, you must mark that as well. So in this case, we would mark all of these uh, uh, four vertices as being part of the fault and this endpoint as being a buried fault edge. Uh, we have an arbitrary uh, direction normal or perpendicular to that fault surface. And here I'm just showing the, the neighboring cells uh, within a triangular mesh. Within Pilot, uh, we split the, the mesh along the fault. We do not split the buried edge. So we add additional vertices on, uh, in this case, what we call, that we have the normal pointing to the positive side of the fault. Um, that's just an arbitrary designation. Uh, and we add new vertices on that side. Um, and then we add, associate the Lagrange multiplier with the edge that connects those vertices. We then identify cells that are, have faces on the fault. So in this case, these three triangles have faces on the negative side of the fault. These three uh, triangles have faces on the positive side of the fault. We update the, uh, the connectivity for these cells. So just they use these vertices on the pot, the new vertices on the positive side of the fault instead of the old vertices that are on the negative side. And then we update the surrounding cells. So in this case, we have split the fault. So, and these are, I show a little gap here, but this is a zero volume, zero area. Uh, and we call these the cohesive cells that we've inserted here. And we encapsulate the fault implementation uh, within those cohesive cells. And this is further explained in our 2013 JGR paper. So see that for more uh, details about the implementation. Uh, the, now we're going to start talking about the design of, of Pyleth and uh, how uh, you sort of interact with uh, Pyleth. So Pyleth really focuses on the geodynamics. And we leverage a number of packages um, that were developed uh, by computational scientists to handle uh, output, as well as parallel processing, geographic projections, and gathering user input. So here's Pilot at the top. The two main dependencies are Petsy, where we, which we use for all of our parallel fine and element uh, operations, as well as linear algebra and solvers. Uh, spatial data is our package um, that I wrote for managing all of the information about boundary conditions and materials. It depends on the Proj projection library, uh, as well as uh, Pyr for gathering user input. Um, we have HDF5, which is our primary storage scheme in terms of external files. Uh, we use NetCDF primarily for accessing uh, Exodus 2 files, which it depends itself on HDF5. And at the very lowest level, we have MPI for parallel processing and BLAST LAPAC um, for linear algebra operations. Pilot, you can think of as a, as a hierarchy of components. The top level component is the application itself. And then all of its functionality 
and parameters are given um, in sort of a, a tree or a hierarchy of components. This allows us to separate the functionality in discrete modules, which we call components. Uh, it provides a means for uh, having alternative implementations that use the same interface via just plug and play. Uh, the top level interface uh, is in Python with all of our computational code in C++. We use Swig uh, to provide this interface between C++ and Python. Um, by using Python dynamic typing, it permits adding new modules at runtime. Um, and it also permits users can add functionality without modifying the pilot code uh, itself. A little word about defaults, modularity, and extensibility. The defaults target quasi-static elasticity. So if you are uh, solving a simple quasi-static problem, you can use many of the defaults. This includes uh, that the problem itself is a time-dependent problem. Uh, the governing equation is elasticity. The uh, bulk reality is a linear elastic uh, isotropic bulk reality. Um, boundary conditions are the default as a Dirichlet or displacement boundary condition. Um, so uh, it makes it much easier and quick to set up uh, a quasi static elasticity problem because you can use many of the defaults. Other general defaults is the spatial databases. The type is a simple DB, and I'll talk about spatial data databases more in a moment. Uh, we write data to HDF5 files. We have uh, this a concept of problem defaults that allow you to just specify a name for a simulation. Um, and then all of the output files will base the names of those output files uh, on that name of the simulation. Uh, as I just mentioned, uh, this provides a very modular and extensible interface. You can select alternative components at runtime. And additional alternative components can be added without modifying pilot. This is a, just an example of a, uh, of a section of a parameter file. And in general, the syntax is at the top, you have the pilot application. You walk down the tree in, of components. So you have a component, subcomponent, perhaps even further down the tree. You say component equals the object name that you want that component to be. Any parameter values are just that parameter is equal to a value. So an example of this is here I'm setting up some boundary conditions. So the boundary conditions are part of the problem component. Uh, I can set how many boundary conditions I have and give them names. So here I've created an array of two boundary conditions, one called bc underscore x uh, neg uh, and one bc underscore x positive. I'm applying this one to the uh, x negative face, this one to the x positive face. I set up that uh, those boundary conditions are Dirichlet time dependent boundary conditions using this uh, naming scheme um, that we'll talk more about later. Uh, then we have uh, for a specific boundary condition here, I'm saying I'm walking down the tree. So I have pilot that problem uh, BC because that's my name, my array. Then the name of the boundary condition, in this case, it is the second boundary condition. I tell it what degree of freedom I want constrained. So the X degree of freedom would be degree of freedom zero. I give it the label. This is uh, where in the mesh that's associated with that boundary condition. So I've named that boundary uh, entities, uh, boundary underscore X positive. Um, and then I have my auxiliary field and this for a Dirichlet boundary condition, the auxiliary field provides uh, the constraints or values of that boundary condition. That's the displacements. Uh, in this case, uh, I'm just specifying the amplitude. Um, and so there's no time dependence. So we call that initial amplitude, the two X components. Um, and so I'm specifying a X component of plus two meters. So I would specify an X displacement of plus two meters on the X degree of freedom. Um, and I don't constrain the Y degree of freedom, but my um, auxiliary field has to in terms of where uh, the information is coming from, I actually have to specify both components, um, but this Y component is not being used. Uh, some more information about spatial databases. These are user specified fields or values in space for properties and boundary condition values. Uh, examples of spatial databases, uh, we might have a uniform value for a Dirichlet boundary condition. We call that a zero D database. Piecewise linear variation tractions for a Neumann boundary conditions, we call that a 1D database or, or data dimension. 
We might have distribution of slip on a fault that's in 2D or a 3D seismic velocity model, and that would be a 3D uh, specification. Uh, the advantage of these spatial databases is that they are generally independent of the discretization for the problem. So we can uh, change our mesh and still use the same spatial databases. We can uh, provide our spatial databases at whatever resolution we need to specify the spatial variation. So uniform values, all we need is a single point. If we have uh, a linear variation that's just uh, between two endpoints, we only have to specify those two endpoints. Um, and this gives us great flexibility uh, in terms of specifying parameters uh, on our boundaries. Um, the different types of spatial databases, we have uh, one called uniform DB that's optimized for a uniform value. You just specify it directly in the parameter file. Um, and uh, oops, uh, we have what we call a simple DB. This is for arbitrary distributed points uh, with variations in 0D, 1D, 2D, and 3D. You may want to use a simple DB for a uniform value uh, if you want need to use that uh, specific information multiple places or for multiple simulations and instead of specifying it within every single parameter file and having duplicate information, you can stick in an external file um, that's in the simple, what we call a simple DB, uh, and it's almost as that has the same efficiency. Uh, we also have what we call simple grid. DBs, which is uh, when we have our parameters on a logically gridded variation that's aligned with our coordinate axes. And this allows us to specify uh, the values much more efficiently um, because we only have to, instead of specifying and, and sort of the bookkeeping of determining where every point is and locating uh, points, um, we know it's a logical grid so we can do lookup very fast in 1D, 2D, and 3D. We also have a special case of a zero dB um, that's a uniform database with zero values. We often use this for Dirichlet boundary conditions, um, and so it has a special um, use case uh, and implementation. The documentation for spatial databases is now separate and much more comprehensive, uh, and so it's moved to its own uh, documentation distribution. Uh, it is at spatialdata.readthedocs. Uh, .io, and there's links to that within the pilot documentation. So now let's talk a little bit further about our documentation. There are three uh, sets of manuals for pilot. There is the main pilot manual that's available at uh, pilot.readthedocs.io. There is the information about this installer that's when you want to build uh, from source code on a cluster or for um, development. It's the documentation is at pilot underscore installer dot read the docs dot io. Uh, and then, as I just mentioned, the spatial data documentation. Uh, the online documentation is the preferred source uh, and method for accessing the documentation. The documentation is generally optimized for viewing online. It has a searchable interface. Um, and uh, there are, are both uh, EPUB and PDF files available. Um, the latest version of the pilot documentation is not available currently as a PDF um, because we have some uh, typos and, and sort of uh, LaTeX related um, issues to deal with in, some, in terms of some of the equations to get that built right. But we'll get that built soon. So uh, just want to cover um, some of the organization of the pilot manual. In the main introduction section, we have a preface that it sort of explains uh, what the documentation is for, conventions, a little quick start guide that points you to the first places you should look, uh, information about releases, both the current release as well as all pilot, uh, past releases. Uh, we also include the development plan. Uh, in the user guide part of the introduction, we say what's new with pilot version three, a brief history of pilot, what the workflow is, the architecture, how to get help and report bugs. In the running pilot section, we have sections describing how to define a simulation, the uh, pilot application, uh, all the PETSI options and what are being used and how to control which options are being used, uh, information about how to provide the final lip mesh, a discussion of utilities that are included with pilot, as well as troubleshooting uh, tips. In the uh, pilot component section, that's where you can see the full name and the journal name for uh, all of the pilot components. It lists 
uh, what are the prior properties and components with default values. Those are the things that, that you set in the .cfg files. And then there's included with those are examples of setting the parameters in a .cfg file. Um, these, uh, this section of the documentation is generated automatically directly from the source code. So it's always kept up to date. Um, uh, and, and you can see the default values as well as the examples. So this provides uh, much more comprehensive documentation of what's available um, compared to previous versions of PyLeth. Uh, I just wanna highlight a couple things that there's also the PyLeth man includes a developer guide uh, related to contributing to PyLeth. Here's where you can see what our coding style is, how we use Git, what the layout of the code is. This is maybe if you're browsing through the source code, this may this will help guide you to see what you can find. There's some information about the Petsy final implementations, uh, specifically about um, uh, technical terms that are being used. There's sections for adding new governing equations or bulk realities. Um, if you're uh, a, de a developer wanting to contribute, it explains how to rebuild Petsy and Pyleth. Um, and then there's also a section on how to contribute to the documentation, how to build the documentation, uh, which is generally you don't need to install and build all of Pyleth um, to build the documentation. You just need a few um, dependencies uh, related to how we build the documentation and um, uh, convert the, the Sphinx in markedly structured text into HTML. Uh, the utilities, there's a, uh, a relatively complete description of the utilities in a section of the manual. Um, we have a number of new utilities available in uh, Pilot version three. There is uh, a utility that displays the prior properties and facilities that are available for any given component. Um, uh, this is uh, sort of comparable to what you get in the uh, Pilot component section of the manual, but, but you can run it interactively uh, on the command line. There is a CFG search utility that will search and display metadata in .cfg files. So you can search through examples looking for specific features uh, or other or uh, uh, descriptions of the parameters um, in terms of uh, features available in a file to find examples. Uh, there's a utility for running all pilot simulations in a given path. Uh, we use this uh, for testing so that we can um, uh, look at and run all the examples and make sure they work. There's a pilot dump parameters utility um, that will dump out all of I, the values uh, that you use uh, for a given dot, uh, set of parameter files. That's the .cfg files. So you can get a look of the comprehensive parameters being used and the default values uh, and view those without actually having to run the simulation. If you run a simulation, those parameters are also dumped. Uh, for viewing uh, and debugging. There is a utility called Pilot EQ Info that'll compute earthquake rupture metrics such as moment magnitude, seismic moment, and average slip for each of your fault surfaces. Uh, and then there's a utility for uh, reconstructing the XDMF files from HDF5 files. This is very useful in post-processing that you can do some post-processing, add additional uh, uh, fields in HDF5 files and then regenerate the XDMF files so that you can then view uh, that information in Paraview. This is an example of the uh, graphical user interface for the parameters. You can run it by uh, in the binary package by uh, changing to the parameters GUI uh, and then just run the parameter view viewer. It'll load up, uh, start a web server on your uh, local machine and you can go to a local port and view and you can collapse, you can expand and you can see all of the description of the parameters, the default values, uh, as well as values that are being set and where they were set from. Um, uh, and you can control how much information you see by collapsing and expanding the, the component hierarchy. Now we're gonna talk about how you get started using Pilot. Uh, our top two recommendations are read the pilot user manual um, and do not ignore error messages and warnings. If you receive see error messages and warnings, uh, it means pilot is detecting that something is not going well. Um, and you should uh, scroll to the very top and look for the first error message or warning um, because sometimes you may have a cascade of errors um, and the last error you see may not be 
um, the error that is causing the problem. It's the usually the first error that you see that causes the problem. Uh, we recommend using an example or benchmark as a starting point uh, to get help. There is the CIG community forum with a category uh, dedicated to Pyleth. Um, and you can also get a lot of information on the users tab on the Pyleth uh, webpage um, shown here. So if you go to the Pyleth webpage on CIG, you'll see a users tab um, that you can uh, access for more information, links to the manuals, links to the community forum, uh, as well as uh, other um, uh, information of it being available. Um, okay, let's walk through how you create a simulation. So this is our recommended steps uh, for creating a simulation. We recommend you always start with creating a diagram of the boundary value problem. That is a diagram that shows the geometry, uh, your sort of outline of what materials you're going to have um, as, uh, and include uh, what boundary conditions you have. Uh, if you have time dependence, where is the time dependence coming in? Where are your faults? Um, and so forth. Uh, then in terms of generating the final mesh, we recommend that you start with a diagram of your geometry. Uh, you know, where is it coming from? What does it look like? How are you going to... Uh, and you often, when you create the geometry, we often refer to that diagram. Um, and we show this uh, in our examples. Um, if you're using GMesh after you create the geometry, whether you build it up from points into curves, into surfaces, or you start with uh, geometric primitives such as rectangles, spheres, circles, and so forth, um, you next mark your boundaries uh, using the geometry that's in GMesh. Then you generate your mesh, and then you check for mesh quality. If you're using qubit, you generate the mesh, and then you mark your boundaries. Um, and I'll, I'll highlight this a bit later. Uh, the main thing to point out here is that however you generate your mesh, you always want to check your mesh quality to make sure you have a good mesh um, once it's generated. If you have severely distorted cells, that affects the accuracy as well as how quickly the solver will converge. Once we have our mesh, then we create our parameter files. Um, those are our .cfg files uh, based on our geometry uh, and the, the fine element mesh. Once we have our parameter files, then we create our spatial databases, and then we have everything we need to run a pilot simulation. Uh, in terms of creating the parameter files, uh, generally we start at the top, we select our governing equation that's associated with our material, we set the solution field based on our governing equation. So how many unknowns do we have in our governing equation? We need to make sure the solution field is uh, set up accordingly. We set the basis order for that solution field for each of its subfields. That would be the displacement, potentially uh, the Lagrange multiplier if we have a fault. We choose our output. Do we want output the solution on the domain? Do we want it on a boundary? Do we want it on points? Do we want it on all three? How often do we want that output? Do we want it every time step? every other time step and so forth. Um, what fields do we want output? Um, for our materials and bulk rheologies, we set those based on the governing equation. Um, we set our faults and how many ruptures or uh, kinematic sources we want. If we want creep as well as earthquakes or just creep or just earthquakes, how many earthquakes do we want? Um, we can set all that up uh, within the parameter file. Then we set our boundary conditions. Which boundaries have boundary conditions? Are they Dirichlet or Neumann boundary conditions? We set uh, the basis order of all our auxiliary subfields. That's for our materials, for our fault slip, for our Dirichlet and Neumann uh, boundary conditions. Um, and then finally, based on all that information, we'll update our metadata at the top of our file to indicate what features we are using, who created the file, what's the description of what we're solving, um, what dependencies do we have in terms of other .cft files? Um, and this really helps keeping track of uh, your simulations. What are they used for? Um, how do the, uh, do you depend on multiple .cft files um, or do you just have it all encapsulated in a single one? Then uh, in terms of creating spatial databases, we select our data dimension. If it's uniform, we have just a single point. That's a zero D database, do we have a linear variation, such as just some variation with depth, um, or a long strike, or down dip? Do we have uh, it, 
available as a, or specifying a surface such as a variation in slip both along strike and down dip, uh, variation in material properties, um, uh, both uh, laterally as well as with depth. Um, and then uh, for a 3D simulation complex variation material properties, we would use a volume that's a data dimension of three. Then we, once we know our data dimension and sort of our basic layout of where our va what values we need to specify and sort of whether it's a linear variation or so forth, we can specify what spatial database implementation we want to use, whether it's a uniform D, DB, simple DB that's for irregular point distribution or a simple grid uh, DB, which uh, are points on a logical grid aligned with the coordinate axes. Um, and uh, if you're using a simple DB or simple grid DB uh, and generating uh, your values from, say, an analytical function, you can use uh, Python to generate those. Uh, and there's examples of that in the spatial database uh, documentation. Some general tips are when you're starting to use Pilot to start simple. Uh, almost, this is generally uh, means you start with a 2D problem. Simplify your geometry just down to the bare minimum. Uh, use a coarse mesh, use a static simulation, and use prescribed slip if you have a fault. Um, and then gradually increase the complexity in steps. Um, so if you have a time-dependent problem, you would probably start with a static simulation, then add the time dependence. Then increase the mesh, res mesh resolution where it's needed. So you may see that you need a higher resolution to resolve specific features. So increase your mesh resolution in those areas. If you want to add fault friction, then you would transition from prescribed slip to the spontaneous rupture. And only after you had all that working in say 2D would you transition to 3D. Um, and then once you have sort of your, uh, either your final 2D or 3D setup, then increase the resolution of your geometry as needed um, to capture uh, various features. So. Um, often, uh, you may want to slowly increase your resolution of your fault geometry so that you can see, you know, where does it make a difference, where does it not make a difference, um, as well as sort of material boundaries. Uh, let's now talk a little bit about the general uh, GMesh and Qubit workflow. Uh, you first create your geometry. In most cases, uh, within for a 2D simulation, you're going to construct your geometry of the surfaces from points that are built up into curves. Um, you can use basic shapes uh, if they uh, work well for your uh, geometry. So you might start with a rectangle and then subdivide it to add in all of the different um, uh, pieces such as fault and in, in material interfaces. Um, you can also uh, then uh, create your domain and subdivide it, create uh, say your fault interfaces um, point in point is the fault surfaces must be interior interface surfaces. Or, um, they cannot be on the boundary of your domain. Um, you do need separate volumes for different constituent models, but not different parameters. So if you have an elastic rea bulk rheology in one part of your domain and a, say a viscoelastic rheology in another part of the domain, that would be two different uh, materials and they need to have different volumes or different surfaces if you're operating in 2D. If you're just varying what your bulk constituent parameters are, you don't need separate uh, entities. So you can have just a single surface or single volume uh, for those. When you tag your entry, uh, entities for boundary conditions, materials, and faults, uh, as I mentioned before, in GMesh, you can just tag the geometry before generating the mesh. In Qubit, uh, you need to tag after generating the mesh. Um, and then once you uh, everything is tagged, you have your geometry in GMesh, you create your final mesh, and then write it to a file. Um, and generally, those last most of your effort is going to be spent in the creating the geometry. It sometimes takes a little bit of effort to tag everything correctly. Um, but usually, that once you have everything tagged, everything set up, actually generating the mesh is quite quick. Um, and in terms of uh, one aspect of creating the final mesh, as I mentioned before, is to always check the quality. You may need to uh, run some smoothing to improve the mesh quality. Uh, 
just to uh, amplify that you need to tag entities for buried edges of faults. Um, and uh, creating the mesh, uh, you specify the meshing scheme, the mesh sizing. Uh, the mesh sizing generally is much easier in Gmesh than it is in Qubit. It has some very sophisticated, handy ways to specify the mesh size, such as distance from the fault. Um, and of course, uh, smoothing to fix any poorly quality cells. Uh, some additional mesh generation tips. If you have topography and dithymetry, uh, generally just use a flat surface unless you know it matters. We now have from uh, NSAR and other and uh, LIDAR very accurate representations of topography. Um, many cases have high resolution bathymetry as well. In most cases, um, you really don't, it's not going to make a difference. Uh, and it just really slows down the mesh, meshing process. Um, if you try to include very high resolution topography and bathymetry. Um, so use it if you know it matters, but uh, ignore it if you can get away with it, at least in the beginning. Um, fault surfaces, uh, building surfaces from contours is usually the easiest um, and include features at the resolution that matters. Uh, you may have very fine uh, information at the surface, but at depth you may not. Um, and so you need to balance those two. Um, in terms of mesh generation performance, the number of points and spline curves and surfaces can have a huge effect on the mesh generation runtime. Uh, in general, qubit does not run in parallel. Uh, Gmesh can run uh, on multiple threads uh, for some meshing algorithms. Um, you can use the uniform global refinement in Pyloth for large simulations. That's you can generate your mesh at a coarser resolution, and Pyloth will automatically refine it. That is turn sort of uh, reduce the discretization size uniformly by a factor of two or four. Um, this generally is useful in, in uh, meshed meshes with greater than about 10 million cells. Um, and now in pilot version three, you can use a higher basis order of say two or three to get the same accuracy using larger cells. So a basis order of one corresponds to a linear variation of the solution within a field, or, sorry, within a cell. Uh, with a basis order of two, you're, add, you're adding more terms in that polynomial. So now you're a basis order of two, you have quadratic terms. And so you can represent uh, curvature in the um, solution within a cell, whereas before with a basis order of one, you could only represent a linear variation. This is particularly important for problems with gravitational body forces where your stresses are often linearly increasing and with depth. Uh, and your displacements uh, may have a second order variation. Uh, finally, there's no silver bullet in fine element gener mesh generation uh, for, uh, you can do things many different ways. Uh, some ways are better than others, but in some cases you can do uh, completely different methods and you get uh, just as useful a result. Um, in terms of whether you use hexahedral quadrilateral, quadrilateral meshes versus tetrahedral or triangular meshes. Um, the hexes and quads are slightly more accurate. They're sometimes a little faster. Um, the tet and, and triangular meshes can handle much uh, complex geometry much better. Uh, it's easy to vary the discretization size with tetrahedral, triangular, and quadrilateral cells when you have unstructured meshes. Um, the hexahedral meshes tend to be very structured and it can be difficult to vary discretization size to capture uh, small features. Um, as I said, there's really no easy answer for a given accuracy, a finer resolution temp mesh that varies the discretization size in a more optimal way might run faster than a hexahedral mesh that has a very, that's much more rigid for that discretization size. Um, check and double check your mesh, um, particularly in qubit. Sometimes qubit will see an error and it will just keep on running through your journal file um, and you won't realize um, that there was an energy, uh, error generated until you're done with your mesh and so you see either volumes that weren't mesh or missing boundaries, uh, sections of boundaries that you thought were being marked that weren't being marked. Um, so you have to be very careful and look at, your, uh, look at the output log uh, when you're generating meshes. Gmesh, once it generally finds an error, it stops and aborts and tells you what the error is. Uh, you need to make sure that your boundaries are marked correctly for your boundary conditions. Uh, both tools uh, allow you to visualize how things are marked 
uh, on your boundary. And as I've said several times before, check your mesh quality. The aspect ratio should be close to one. By close, uh, most metrics go from zero, go, sorry, go from one to infinity, and you want those values. Generally, uh, aspect ratio, generally less than two, ideally less than about 1.3 or 1.4. Uh, some additional sort of tips and issues and how to solve them. Um, when you change your geometry, this also usually causes changes in the object IDs that are referred to within uh, the meshing tools. Um, if you can name your object and use variables, if you're using a, a Python interface or the qubit apropos interface, if you assign value, object IDs to variables, this can help eliminate uh, using hardwired IDs that change when the geometry changes or changes with uh, different versions uh, of the meshing tools. Um, so whenever qubit changes the geometry engine version, oftentimes the object IDs uh, are different. Uh, as I mentioned before, spline as many points can slow down operations. So the, the way is to optimize the number of points to give you in the spline to give you just the geometry that you need. Um, where surfaces meet in very small angles, such as like the and uh, a trench of a subduction zone that can create distorted cells. So you may want to trim that geometry to eliminate features that are smaller than a cell size. Um, if you run into difficulty meshing, meshing complex geometry with hexahedral or quadrilateral cells, use tetrahedral or triangular cells, even if it requires a finer mesh. Um, hexahedral meshes often oversample parts of the domain. Um, so you can uh, use a coarser, perhaps tetrahedral mesh with a more optimal variation in the discretization size. Um, when you, if you have extended surfaces, it can lead to very complex geometry um, that and uh, intersections that can cause distorted cells. Um, so it's often best to try and embed the surfaces to eliminate overly complex geometry. This is particularly true for fault surfaces, where if you can just embed the fault surface itself within your domain, uh, rather than having to extend it to all uh, exterior boundaries, uh, you can end up with a much simpler overall geometry and makes it, makes it much easier to mesh. So first steps uh, to get started in terms of uh, using Pilot, Create, we recommend creating a little player for working examples so that uh, you don't overwrite um, uh, the example fi files that are provided with Pyleth. So if you just uh, CD to your top level Pyleth directory where you installed it, make a new directory and then copy all of the example files uh, to that directory. Uh, work through relevant examples. Uh, try to complete relevant exercises that are listed in the manual. Um, if you need help, ask questions. Um, and then uh, once you've started to play, after you've played around with the examples, um, identify a problem of interest and try to modify an example to look like your problem of interest and slowly work through converting it from the existing example um, to uh, the problem that you want to solve. And that concludes our overview of Pilot version three.